I think you're seeing that start to happen in markets of multifamily where you might see anywhere from a, a 3% to maybe up to a 10% price reduction. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me as always on these Wednesdays, we got Matt Jones. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about you, Todd? Oh man, I'm doing fantastic. It's been a busy last, uh, well, last couple months, but man, we, uh, we've had a lot of fun. So we just closed on a property uh, yesterday. Well, as we're recording yesterday, I guess, as this was released a week ago, uh, we just closed on our 96 unit building in Lexington, Kentucky. It's the one we talked about on the show already. Um, that was our first 506 C offering. So that was kind of fun uh, to, to actually do and get out. It, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, we can talk a little bit about, you know, the pros and cons about that 506 C after the fact, uh, maybe we'll dive in there a little bit. Uh, but you know, we're ready right now to hit the ground running. We also, it's a little different deal. So we'll dive into that as well. So, um, and then I think, you know, Matt, just what's going on this, the, the capital markets, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, we are hearing from brokers. We are hearing from lenders that, that things are softening up, um, which is the first time in a long time that things have been softening up and uh, uh, just interesting to see where this market's going to go. Personally, I don't think we're headed for a crash, at least in multifamily, but uh, we might see this super extreme seller's market, maybe, maybe, maybe even turn to a buyer's market, but I think for sure it'll turn into more of a neutral market, uh, where you'll see some of this, uh, cr the, the craziness that was going on, especially over the last like year and a half, uh, will, will kind of dissolve. So. Yeah, that's true. I, I did just see that uh, the April single family home sales slowed down quite a bit. Yep. So April single family home sales slowed down. You're going to see, you know, and here's the deal. Real estate is a lag, right? It's it, you think about multifamily property or let's even look at a single family, which goes even faster. You know, you have at the best, you have 30 days to close 30 to 60 days for a single family house to close. So what happened in April, actually transpired in March and February, right? Those deals got under contract in February. Those deals got under contract in March and then they closed in April. So multifamily is even longer. You're talking like 60 to 90 days. So the deals that closed in April got under contract in February or January, or in some cases, maybe even in late December. And they finally closed then in April. So we're a lag. So what's happening right now, what the reaction is happening today in the market in May, you're actually in May, May, June, you're actually not going to see the results of that for another roughly 60 to 90 days. So mm -hmm. two to two to three months, we're not going to actually see the results play out until that happens. And I can guarantee you this, the, the majority of the brokers, of course, the brokers that you've built good relationships will, will likely be a lot more honest with you, but the brokers are not going to be the first ones to tell you that, Hey, the market's, you know, getting soft or, Hey, you know, you can probably come in at a little lower offer on this deal that I've got listed. They're probably not going to tell you that, right. They're trying to get them. They're still trying to get the maximum amount of dollars in it. So, you know, we'll see how this plays out, but there's definitely some softening in the market. Uh, I heard the other day, and I don't know what if this is an actual statistic. I kind of feel like it was more of just a feeling, but there's a guy that was talking about Texas, uh, Dallas, Austin, and um, and San Antonio, and they're seeing price reductions of ten to fifteen percent. 
Um, and so I think you're seeing that start to happen in markets of multifamily where you might see anywhere from a, a 3% to maybe up to a 10% price reduction. Well, yeah, that's uh, definitely softening up. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, it's quite frankly, is a, is a great thing. I think sellers have had too much leverage over the last you know, especially a year, but uh, they've just been gaining more and more leverage since it became a seller's market back in what, maybe 2016, 2017. And so they've just had too much leverage. Um, and I, I think that's never a good thing in a market when one party has the that much control. Um, and so you know, uh, I think this is great. That'll soften the market back up and, and maybe, maybe the buyers will eventually have some leverage, but at least get closer to neutral um, to where both sides can have a, have a transaction that, that works for each. Yeah, that sounds good because these past six months, uh, you know, when I'm underwriting properties, it feels like an exercise in futility. <laughs> you know, I, mm -hmm. I underwrite and I, I see, ask the broker like, okay, what's this uh, deal coming in at? And like, <laughs> man, how, how are people like, planning to pay these exorbitant prices, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I'm just having trouble seeing uh, this, you know, it, you know the, uh, it seems like people have to pay like these high prices in order and everything has to go right in the deal for them to make money. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We, yeah, I certainly, you don't want to count on that because mm -hmm. things don't always go right. They have been going right for the last several years, but things don't mm -hmm. always go right. And so you definitely want to be able to get in deals where, Things can go wrong and you're going to be okay. Uh, that's, that's one thing we've tried to focus on here lately. You know, this, so this deal that we just closed on was a very light value add. And that's one thing we really liked about it. It was very light value add, actually mostly uh, property preservation value add. So it's not even that we're doing a lot of things that are going to uh, drastically raise rents. It was more of a value uh, play on the management side. Uh, and even though the upside, the likelihood, Matt, of us returning 30% or something crazy like the 30, 40, 50% IRR to our investors, that likelihood is pretty slim. Like the market would have to go bonkers for another five years for that to happen. But what we liked about the deal is that the downside was very low. And, and so we felt like in this market environment with the volatility that is out there, this property in particular has very, very little downside. So we will be able to provide in, in our, in our theory is we will be able to provide our investors a return on their investment uh, with, with pretty good certainty. Right. And we don't have to count on, 10% rent increases in order just for us to hit our pro forma numbers. Awesome. Yeah. Like uh, you said, it being a management play, like you, you can control the efficiencies in the systems right. a lot easier than a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. We can control the leases. We can control, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are pretty easy for us to control to be able to, and, and quite frankly, it already cash flows pretty well. And so even with the cash flow that we got right now, would the would the returns if we didn't if we took the cash flow right now and that just flatlined and we couldn't do anything would this be a a great deal no but would it work yes and that's kind of what we're looking at on deals right now is will this property cash flow and make sense for our investors yes or no like yes on this property absolutely like it, again, it's not going to be a home run. The investors aren't going to make massive returns, but they're going to make better returns than if it just sat, you know, in a bank account. They're going to make better returns than if it sat in a CD account. But if things don't go well and they just flatline, are we making a 10% return, 20% return, 30% return? You know, maybe, maybe not, but. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, we want to preserve capital as well. So yeah, and so I'm curious. Uh, you know, now that you've you've closed on your first 506C offering, what are some lessons learned, and, and how how does it you know work different on your end compared to a 506B? 
Yeah. So one of the great things, obviously, is we were able to talk about this deal. So we did several things that we talked about this deal. First, we, we put some sponsored ads out there on Facebook and LinkedIn. So that was kind of nice to be able to do that. The The idea is just to get the Endurus uh, name out there a little bit more, get people more familiar with the brand. It's hard for people to know about the brand if you can't ever talk about it. Right. So 506B, you got to be careful how you talk about it. So just getting yourself out there and having a live deal is, is always easier to talk about something. Um, and, and we were able to bring it to our conference. I thought that was really fun. We did this whole, uh, you know, basically case study of this deal. We brought a lot of the key players that were part of the transaction, the brokers and, and uh, you know, lender and so on. We brought them to the table and we all talked about this deal. So that was really cool. We talked about it on the podcast. So that, you know, it's been fun to be able to actually talk about a live deal that's transacting, that's going on versus having to talk about it after the fact. And, you you know, just like trying to think back about all the things that happened. So that's, that's definitely been a huge positive um, for us some negatives. We had some investors that wanted to invest in the deal that would have been able to invest in the deal had it been a 506B. Now, we also at the same token had some investors that would never have invested in that deal because they didn't know about us that did invest. Now, I'll make sure I let people on this show know because I think I'm doing a disservice if you tell people we put this out there and we got a ton of investors that we've never met before that invested in it. No, the vast majority of our investors were already pre-existing relationships. This is more of a, we're trying to find more relationships. And by putting this out on 506 C, we're able to advertise, we're able to really get our word out there. And hopefully we get a few new contacts from doing that. So that's more or less. Did we get a couple investors from being able to advertise? Yes. But, that was not our capital stack. Very, very few dollars came from outside source, outside of our relationship. So I want to make sure people understand that that's not what's going to happen when you, when you do a 506C. Some people think I got to do a 506C because I got to raise $5 million and I'll just put it out there and people will start investing in it. That's not true. That's just not true. Your friends and family are still going to be your investors. Um, so yeah, so definitely a negative that we couldn't take some potential investors that were excited about the deal. They wanted to invest, but unfortunately they weren't accredited investors, so they couldn't invest. Um, I I saw a post on social media, actually private messages the guy. I'm like, hey, just so you know, like you probably should talk to your C, uh, uh, securities attorney about this post. I'm not turning you in by any means, but you should probably just like make sure they're okay with it. This guy posted that he's got this exciting deal in, in Los Angeles and, um, you know, uh, t talked all about it. And then he said, this is a 506 B offering. This cannot, you know, if you are a friend, a Facebook friend of mine or, you know, other, other connection, you're able to invest. Otherwise, you know, it's 506 B. So you're not able to, well, I cannot invest in this guy's deal, even though I'm his Facebook friend, because him and I don't know each other. We're Facebook friends. Like that's it. That's our relationship is we're Facebook buddies. That's not a substantive pre-existing relationship, right? It, it doesn't qualify. So, that by me doing a 506 C I could do that. It allows me to do that. Now I don't have to say if you're a relationship of mine, I can say if you're seeing this and you're an accredited investor, reach out to us. But he's got all these people responding to me like, Hey, I'm interested in this deal. Like, do you actually know that person? That's the key is 506 B. You just can't take anybody. And by the way, just by doing that, and it's in it in it of itself, it is very, very risky. Mm -hmm. Even if he doesn't take any of those people, he just put himself at a high level of risk with the SEC coming down on him for publicly advertising. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely want, don't want to, you know, cross over that line. 
I don't feel like going to jail. Um, and I, I don't come, feel I like come visit, yeah. Fines. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, I don't, you know, just like do things the right way. Even if you don't like it, like, I don't like some of these rules. I don't think they, I, what does an accredited investor really mean? Like, why, why are they some sort of special person that can invest in these deals? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. In my opinion, like, the government has no business telling people where they can invest their money. The government goes ahead and allows people to go to a casino. Matt, you, you can go to a casino and anybody can go to a casino. Somebody that just found $50 on the street floating there has never had any money in their pocket. And somehow like this $50 bill shows up on the street and they pick it up. They can literally go to the casino and blow all of that $50, but they can't do something responsible with that money. Right. And now would never take somebody that only has $50. Right. But, but, but you get my point. Like they can go and gamble that they can go and spend that on anything they want, anything legal, right. They can go, they can blow it on whatever and it doesn't matter. And they'll blow it on illegal things too. A lot of times, but, but that's okay. They could even take that $50 and start buying stocks with it. That's so interesting. I guess, I mean, that I never really thought about it like that, but that's so true. Like, you know, uh, as a, a real estate investor who raises capital, you know, I'm not going to take somebody's last $50,000 that they need to live off of to pay their medications and mortgage and all that, but they can take that to the casino and just put it all on the roulette table on you know, one number. And, and they do. <laughs> and they do. And that's okay. Like the government says nothing about that. That's okay to go ahead and do that. Hey, hell, go have fun. But somehow it's different because it's entertainment. They can go bet on that horse. They can go bet on a football game. They can go to hit the roulette table, like you said. And like, that's okay because it's entertainment. But the second it becomes not entertainment, and oh, by the way, it's okay if it's stocks too, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, because somehow those are safe, right? As we all know, as we're all looking at the market today, you know, Bitcoin and, uh, you know, and, and Tesla are safe havens, right? Well, Tesla's value is down 60%. If you put money in Tesla three months ago, you lost half your value of your money, right? But that's okay because it's the stock market. But, but you can't put that on a private placement because we want to protect you. Why don't we keep you safe? want to make sure that you're in good hands. That makes, it makes no sense. It's silly, mm -hmm. but I don't make the rules. I just follow them. That's just how it is. Um, you know, they're talking about raising the accredited investor net worth. It hasn't been raised since I think it's like 1987 or something mm -hmm. like that it was the last time. That's when the million dollar threshold you know, came, if you were to take inflation, it would be somewhere in like the three and a half million dollar range. Um, and they're talking about raising it potentially even up to $10 million net worth for an accredited wow. investor, which would really change the game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause so there's, I mean, the people that have a 10 per 10 million or higher net worth is it's like a half a percent of the U S population. So I'm curious about the, the future of your offerings. Are you going to focus primarily on, on 506B or 506C or yeah. kind of a combination thereof? Yeah, good question. Uh, right now, I don't think we're ready to go all 506C, but that's probably something in the future just to make sure we're protecting ourselves as a company and protecting our investors as well. But we, again, like it, it irritates me to have to choose Matt, because I've got a lot of non-accredited investors that are very sophisticated that want to put their money into real estate investments. And I want to be able to give them the opportunity. You know, they're tired of investing in the stock market volatility and, and in the common, you know, common folk uh, investments and, seeing, you know, these big fees that they have to pay. And, and, you know, like I said, this big volatility, they want to invest it in real estate. And if I go 506C, they can no longer invest in my properties. 
And that just, that just irritates me. Like, like I'm sure Alba listeners can tell, I get irritated by already the regulations that are in place. Um, and so I, I hate doing it, but it's probably going to have to happen just so we can move our business in the direction we want to. Um, yeah. But right now we're not ready to go there uh, and commit to it. So we'll probably still offer some 506 B um, you know, there's other regs that we can go with the reg a um, those are a lot more expensive to set up, but that might be something we look at in the future as well. That way we can take accredited and non accredited and we can still uh, publicly advertise and we can still make sure we're following the rules. Yeah. So anyways, lo lots of stuff here. The, the market is very interesting. We're, we're, I'm quite frankly, Matt, I'm, I'm excited to see how this all plays out. I think multifamily is going to fare pretty well, but I'm excited to see how it plays out. I'm excited to hopefully have a little bit more of a neutral market where we can finally negotiate again, where we not putting, where we're not putting huge earnest money down, you know, like, we're looking at a, a deal or several deals where we have to put a sizable amount of hard earnest money down. And you just don't know what you're getting until you fully walk these properties. I mean, there's been, I would say almost every property. Now we don't retrade. So I guess maybe you're going, well, why does that matter? Cause we don't typically retrade anyway, but there's been many properties, Matt, that we've walked and we're like, holy cow we i can't imagine the amount of work we have to do here is way more than what we expected now I mean, there there was the the one in and i talked about it on this podcast in little rock where we walked that property and happily we had no hard earnest money but if we had hard earnest money like that would have been gone there's because there was zero possibility i could have kept going with that. Now, we likely would have had to sue them because they fraudulated their books, they cooked their books. So that's pretty, you know, egregious. But had they even not cooked their books, and it just would have been the property condition. Man, I mean, there was so much work there that we did not expect that was hidden. Um, it was just unreal. And so putting big hard earnest money down without really being able to fully inspect the property is a big risk that buyers have been taking um, just to get these properties locked up. And, and there's no way you're getting these properties locked up without taking that risk for, for the most part, you know, for so, so some markets had not gotten there yet, but, um, but man, it, I'm hoping that goes away. Um, that, that actually, in it, in it of itself would excite me. If that just, if that went away, I would call that a big win for, mm -hmm. for buyers. Yeah. And it's good that you're hyper-focused on all the details. So you caught the cookbooks and, and uh, the extra problems. Cause I, I bet you there's somebody else bought the property and uh, wasn't so focused on uh, what they needed to be. And, and they got a nasty surprise afterwards. Well, I tell you what their, their plan was, um, and, and I haven't followed to find out what has happened, but their plan was to wrap that property up into a package of properties. So basically, so that hopefully would get just kind of either missed or ignored of like, uh, it's just one of the properties. These other ones are good. We're just going to move forward with this transaction, even though that's kind of a dog. We'll be able to, blended in. So that's, that was their plan of like, we're just going to blend this into our other several properties and hope that it, it's not a big deal. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, and it, I don't know if it's sold or not uh, where it's at, but man, it just, just, but it just goes to show you that the risk that you have or have by putting this, this hard earnest money down before we're, we're truly looking at a deal. So excited. Hopefully, hopefully stuff like that shakes out. I, I'm, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting, I think we're going to, we're in for an interesting, probably, uh, you know, year to two year time frame here. Um, we'll see what happens. I, I don't, again, I'm not going to sit here and predict a, a recession. A lot of other people are, I'm not ready to predict a recession. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Uh, but if it does, we're just, we're prepared. We're quite frankly excited. Um, Sounds good. All right, man. Uh, I don't have anything else to you. 
No, that's it for today. All right. Well, you have a fantastic rest of the day. Make every day Saturday. Thanks, you too. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.